As we look forward to the day when all the world will see uh, what we have proclaimed uh, that Messiah Yeshua is coming back to rule and reign from Jerusalem as king over all the earth. Um, we could use some uh, leadership from a king who would make decisions that would be a blessing uh, to the followers of Messiah. Instead, we have the challenge of uh, bringing the message of the love of God into a fallen world and a world that uh, all too often doesn't want to hear that message. And of course, when they won't hear what we're saying, what do we need to do? Scream louder, right? No, we, you were worried about me. You thought that was really the right answer. We need to live in such a way that they see the message manifest in our lives uh, and realize that we have a peace that they don't have. We have a hope that they don't have. Uh, and we have um, confidence in what is yet to come, the ultimate blessing that we will experience as the followers of Messiah, the hope of spending the rest of eternity uh, in his presence. And uh, our message is, it's not about what you've done in the past. It's not about how good you are. It's about what he has done in the past and what he is going to do in the future and what he will do right now for you in the presence. And so we uh, have so much to be uh, encouraged about. We have so many reasons uh, to be hopeful. And we really find the... Uh, the um, the recipe, the way that we uh, come to this understanding is by reading the scriptures, spending time uh, in his word. And that's why uh, we seek truth from his word, uh, even this night. In last week's Torah portion, we've been going through uh, Genesis, uh, the book of Genesis, and we come to the portion uh, where uh, following uh, Abraham entering into a covenant relationship with the Lord, God made a promise to Abraham that he would have a son uh, by Sarah is what we later find that found, uh, found out or find out. And um, Yitzchak, Isaac, whose name means laughter, uh, is born as the child of promise to uh, Abraham and Sarah. And then in last week's portion, uh, Sarah dies in uh, Hebron, Hebron. Uh, and Abraham purchases the cave of Machpelah uh, for her burial. Uh, and then Abraham sent his chief servant to Haran uh, to find a wife for Isaac. And the servant returned with Rivka, Rebecca. And for Isaac, it was love at first sight, though not all was perfect, uh, as we see at the start of this week's portion, uh, as we will talk about in just a moment. And uh, in uh, last week's portion, Abraham dies and is buried where? In the cave of Machpelah that he purchased uh, for Sarah. And uh, more of um, the patriarchs uh, will be buried there and uh, their wives. Uh, but um, now we are going to pick up um, with Isaac, the child of the promise. Let's just go to the Lord in prayer. God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Lord, we seek truth from your word tonight. Uh, Lord, as we know that you are able to, to reveal truths uh, and, and uh, that each time we read your word, Lord, your ruach, your spirit uh, can help us to uh, see things that we might not have seen before. So, Lord, uh, I ask you to speak through me uh, encouragement uh, and blessing uh, for all who are here. Uh, through the portion that we will, portions that we will take a look at tonight. I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be acceptable in your sight. My rock and my redeemer, I ask it in Yeshua's name. Amen. All right, this week's portion, if you want to follow along, it begins in Bereshit, Genesis 25, verse 19. It's called Toldot, uh, which means history. Uh, it's the history of Isaac who at the age of 40 has married Rebekah. But in Genesis 25, verse 21, we find that there is a problem. 
uh, as with the case with uh, as was the case with Sarah, Rebecca is unable to have a child. She is barren. Tonight we will see a number of similarities in the lives of Abraham and Isaac. Uh, if you'll remember, Sarah was barren. Uh, and so it would take a miracle of God to produce a child through her. Uh, and that is exactly what was accomplished. And tonight we will see a number of similarities in the lives of Abraham and Isaac. Uh, and Isaac's wife's uh, barrenness is just the first. Uh, this is really kind of like uh, a sequel. Uh, Back to the Future, part two, if you will, um, to reinforce God's sovereign choosing uh, of Isaac, uh, as opposed to Ishmael uh, as the one who will receive the promises that were given to Abraham. Doesn't mean Ishmael won't be blessed, but the promise is going to go through Isaac. <coughs> After Isaac's intercession, the Lord enables Rebecca to become pregnant with twins. Uh, as you all know, if you've read ahead in the story or maybe have been paying attention uh, when you've gone through these events in the past. And there's a bit of a struggle between the twins. The Lord tells uh, Rivka, Rebecca in Genesis 25 verse 23, there are two nations in your womb. From birth, they will be two rival peoples. One will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. Now, the older serving the younger is a theme that we find throughout the scripture. Have you noticed that before? Uh, we first see it with Isaac and Ishmael, but we also see it with Joseph and his older brothers, David and his older brothers. Ephraim and Manasseh. Uh, and Yeshua continues this theme as we read earlier in Matthew 20, verse 28, which says, The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. When Rebekah gives birth to the twins, the firstborn is red and hairy and is named Asav in the Hebrew, which means you have a 50-50 chance here, red or hairy. And I'll give you a clue. The Hebrew word for red is Edom. So, uh, and we're going to talk about that more later. But um, Esav means hairy. It becomes Esau in the English. Because of his hunting skills and Isaac's taste for game, Esau is his father's favorite. The younger twin is named Yaakov in the Hebrew, meaning he catches by the heel or he supplants. And Yaakov becomes Jacob in the English. Jacob is described as a quiet man who dwells in tents. I'm beginning to doubt his Jewish identity with the concept of the quiet man. Most of the Jewish people I knew growing up uh, were not described as uh, quiet men, nor did we dwell in tents if we had a choice. Anyway, Jacob is Rebecca's favorite, uh, and I would suggest that two children being the favorite of two different parents, uh, to use a culinary term, if I may, sounds like a recipe for disaster. And speaking of recipes, Jacob has a recipe that Esau can't resist one day when he comes in hungry from the field. The Hebrew says, and Jacob cooked ha'adom ha'adom, uh, which literally means red, red. Uh, and usually uh, when we see a doubling of the Hebrew, it, it really would be translated as truly red. Um, in exchange for this food, whatever it might've been, Jacob requests Esau's birthright, which is the extra portion that goes to the oldest child. And Esau, agrees as he allow, seemingly allows his hunger to override his appreciation for his birthright. And Genesis 25 verse 34 says, thus uh, Esau, Esau showed how little he um, valued his birthright. As a result, Esau would be called Edom or Edom. Each, every time he was called, he would be reminded 
that he had allowed his fleshly hunger for the red stuff to override his appreciation of his spiritual blessing. And I know when I go through these passages in the scriptures, there's a tendency, my flesh kind of says, would I have made the same mistake? You know, we're thinking to ourselves, come on, Esau, how could you just for some food? I'm sure that we would do much better, right? Remember, Esau had no control over being the firstborn. That was God's doing. But like Esau, we control whether we accept his purpose for our lives or whether we decide to uh, decide by our own rules, to lean on our own understanding, uh, to decide that if we're hungry, the one thing we need to do is eat no matter what. Do we seek God's purpose for our lives or do we go through life telling God about his mistakes? Once again, we're like, no, I would never do that. But what I mean is saying to God, I wish I were prettier. Well, not me. I'm kind of speaking for uh, everybody here. And there are some who may have thought that. I wish I were richer. I wish I were smarter or luckier. I wish I was Jewish. I wish I was not Jewish. You can fill in the blank uh, of where you have reminded God uh, of his mistakes rather than saying, God, what a blessing it is that you can use me just as I am that you have created me the way I am. And that as long as I follow the leading of your spirit, I can accomplish whatever you would accomplish through me uh, as a vessel to accomplish your purposes in this world. In Hebrews 12, verse 16, Esau is described using a Greek word that means profane or godless. Because according to the verse, he gave up his birthright for a single meal. Now, the birthright was not simply a blessing. Uh, there were also additional responsibilities tied to it. One of the reasons for the birthright is because the oldest child was expected to assume the father's responsibilities to carry on the work of the father. And in Shemot, Exodus chapter 4, verse 22, the children of Israel are also described as the Lord's firstborn. But unfortunately, like Esau, many of my Jewish people, including the way I thought as I was growing up, have given up their birthright. They have failed to fulfill their calling to be a testimony to the world of God's faithfulness. Um, it's kind of like Tevye reminding God a little bit of his mistakes and Fiddler on the Roof when he says, I know we're the chosen people, but couldn't you choose somebody else for a change um, because of the persecution um, that he had endured? And it's easy in a fleshly sense to think, I just want to go along. I just want everybody to like me. Um, I, I don't want persecution, but the reality is if we take a stand for the Lord, Yeshua tells us, that we are going to be persecuted uh, and, and that that is something that we should really uh, not be surprised when it comes to pass, but to realize that when they're persecuting us, they're really persecuting him through us and that we have the opportunity to share in the fellowship uh, of his suffering, uh, that we uh, have the hope that um, we can be courageous in the midst of the persecution because he has overcome the world. That the world sometimes seems like it is getting the upper hand, but our God is more powerful than any little G gods in this world, any of the kings of this world, uh, any of the, the ways of this world that, that seem to be um, having success uh, and, and even causing some to say, you know, is there really a God? Why is he allowing this? And as we read the scriptures, we see that he allowed all sorts of sorus is a Yiddish word, all sorts of troubles uh, to come upon us that we might learn to trust in him in a greater way. Uh, our flesh says we begin to doubt when these troubles come upon us. But the reality is he can teach us his truths during times of persecution that we could never hear 
uh, as we're celebrating on the mountaintop. And so we just have to pray and even be encouraged that as we're going through trials and tribulation and times of struggle, our God is able to take what the enemy intends for evil in our lives and he is able to turn it in to something good. It's a blessing as we come to understand these truths. In Genesis 26, verse 4, Isaac receives a promise from the Lord that is similar to what was promised to Abraham. In Genesis 12, verse 3, and Genesis 18, verse 18, the Lord tells Isaac that his descendants will be as numerous as the stars in the sky, and that they will be a blessing to all the nations of the earth. And I know a lot of times when people talk about the blessing of being as numerous as the stars in the sky, the next thing that they tend to come out with is how many stars are in the sky or how many you could see. And the reality is that's just painting a picture uh, of the infinite number of stars in the universe. God saying that the Jewish people who at this time uh, number about one, Isaac, are going to be great in number because of his blessing. And even in addition to that, it is through them that all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed, uh, which ties back to that promise to Abraham in uh, Genesis 12, verse 3. But I have a question that I want to ask you as we continue through Genesis uh, chapter 26. Uh, and you may not have thought about this before. The question is, did Abraham follow the Torah? Uh, and, you know, you might be thinking, well, wait a minute. Abraham came way before the Torah. So how could he follow the Torah? And I would say, well, according to Genesis 26, verse 5, that's exactly what he did. Uh, Genesis 26, verse 5 says, Abraham did what I told him to do. He followed mitzvotai, which means my commandments. Hukotai, which means my regulation. And Torahtai, uh, in the Hebrew, my Torah. Long before the Torah was given to Moses, Abraham followed God's Torah. And in Jeremiah 31, verse 32, Jeremiah talks about a time when we will all know the Torah. I'm trying to see if it's 32 or 33. Let's try uh, 33. Anyway, um, <clears throat> there's different numbering in this uh, chapter and guessing which one it's going to be. Uh, the point is, there is coming a time when it says, uh, we won't have to teach every man his neighbor and every, hand, every man his brother, telling them, know the Torah, for we will all know the Torah, uh, from the least of them to the greatest of them. Because God is going to do what? He is going to write the Torah within them. He is going to write the Torah on their hearts, on, on the hearts of his people. Uh, and this is actually in a passage that is the promise of this coming, uh, sorry, coming final covenant renewal uh, that will take place with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. As um, the promise of the Brit Kadeshah, the promise of the new covenant, is the Torah written on our hearts. Uh, and so um, it shouldn't surprise us that God's Torah is really eternal, uh, that Abraham followed God's Torah as he trusted in the Lord and it was counted to him uh, as righteousness. And Messiah Yeshua will even uh, tell us that the Torah will not pass away uh, and the new covenant will not pass away until first uh, heaven and earth pass away. Uh, and so we know that these are God's everlasting promises uh, to his people and our God is faithful and he will fulfill his promises to his people and to each one of us. Chapter 27 brings us to a time when Isaac has grown old. He's not able to see very well and he frequently can't remember where he placed his glasses. No, just kidding. <clears throat> but Jacob comes along and he's wearing Esau's clothes and he's put some goat skins on his arms and the back of his, the neck uh, so that Isaac uh, who has sent Esau into the field 
uh, to go and fetch some game for him uh, will think that Jacob uh, is Esau. And as a result of the deception, Jacob receives the blessing that Isaac had intended for Esau, another of the divine reversals, uh, as we mentioned earlier. As the blessing includes, once again, the older will serve the younger. But in Genesis 27, verse 40, <coughs> Esau comes to the Lord seeking uh, a blessing. And the Lord tells him, you will serve your brother. But when you break loose, you will shake his yoke off your neck. And Esau, Esau decides that it is time to shake Jacob's yoke off shake Jacob's yoke off his neck all right he decides that he will kill Jacob as soon as their father dies but Rebecca finds out about it and sends Jacob to her family in Haran uh, where he will uh, I you know don't want to spoil it for you so we'll call this a spoiler alert once again uh, find his future wife or actually wives uh, Rachel and Leah Rachel and Leah uh, daughters of his uncle, Lavan, who is also uh, Rebecca's brother. Um, <clears throat> Jacob's uncle, Rebecca's brother. But the reason I mention that is because uh, in Genesis 26, verse 34, we are told that Esau married two Hittite women, uh, which is a disappointment to Isaac and Rebecca. And the Torah portion ends with Esau marrying a third woman, uh, and this one is a descendant of Ishmael. So in tonight's portion, Esau has married three women whom his parent, of whom his parents disapprove. He sold his birthright for some red stuff, and he's planning to kill his brother Jacob. No wonder the Lord says in Malachi 1, verses 2 and 3, as Paul will later expound upon in Romans chapter 9, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I hated. Now here's another pattern that we find throughout the scripture, the pattern of duality, the use of pairs of opposites, such as love and hate. Uh, you know, some people would much rather see it say, Jacob I loved and Esau wasn't exactly my favorite. But we see this, this duality. Uh, because we are to choose love when the world would have us choose hate. Similarly, we are to choose good, even though the world tempts us with evil. We are to choose light instead of the darkness, uh, as we perhaps would seek to hide our sins from others, uh, even though we uh, should realize that we're unable to hide them uh, from the Lord. We always have an audience of at least one. Uh, I think I heard a pastor say that this past week. Um, so, and, and it's a good point uh, that, that we cannot um, hide from uh, the Lord, even though sometimes we feel like we're the only one uh, who's doing what you're supposed to be doing. Uh, as we saw with Eliyahu and he was taught Elijah, uh, he was informed, uh, I got 7,000 more who have not uh, bowed the knee to Baal. We are to choose life, but the world tells us death can be more convenient, such as death of the unborn, death of those diagnosed with birth defects, the death of the elderly, the death of the depressed. God tells us choose life because he has given us life as a gift from him. We're to choose blessing instead of the curse that results from our rebellion against our creator. And in these opposing pairs, we choose between what is right and what is wrong. There is little gray area in between. Spiritually, things are often this black and white. For example, Isaac was the child of promise, not Ishmael. Jacob, not Esau, would be the one to continue the covenant line. And Yeshua said in Matthew 12, verse 30, If you are not for me, you are against me. Verse 40. Try that. Anyway, um, <clears throat> y'all knew it anyway, right? You believe me it's there? Okay. Um, check it out. What, oh, I'm sorry. It says 1230 in my notes, but whether or not that was the right, I think that was the right verse. 
Um, yeah, okay. But we find ourselves uh, being called to go into the world. And this world is a place where we find many shades of gray, many areas where we have numerous options. And it's easy to become overwhelmed when we have to choose between so many possibilities. So what I'm really saying is that God has made it very simple for us. He presents it. You either do this or you do that. Uh, and that's much easier than the decisions that we often face in the world. The best example of that is salvation. There are two options for salvation. We either accept God's way of salvation or we refuse it. Yeshua is the only way of salvation. In John 14, verse 6, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Accepting his sacrifice on our behalf is the only way that anyone can have their sins be forgiven. It's the only means of atonement, fulfilling the requirement in Leviticus 7.11 that there be a blood sacrifice in order for there to be atonement. The life of the flesh is in the blood and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes atonement for your souls. It's up to us whether we accept or reject a gift, the gift of salvation that God freely offers to all. Now, there are some who think, you know, it's not unusual to find a God who hates in the Old Testament, as they would call it, but their theological apple cart takes a tumble when they encounter Jacob I loved and Esau I hated uh, in Romans 9.13, as uh, Rabbi Shaul, the Apostle Paul, is explaining the election of the Jewish people. He reminds us in Romans 9, verse 11, that the election of our people is based on God's sovereignty. The election of the Jewish people is based on God's sovereignty. That it is while Jacob and Esau are in the womb that the Lord tells Rebekah, that the older will serve the younger. So there was nothing that Jacob and Esau had yet had a chance to do. God's election is not based on works. It's based on his sovereign choice uh, for his purposes, which argues against replacement theology. The idea that Israel has been replaced as the chosen people of God because of something that they have done. Replacement theologians accuse the first century Jewish leadership of denying the Messiah, which is true, and conclude that this action has caused God to change his mind about their election, which is false. Actually, a lie from the pit of hell is normally the way I describe it. And uh, in taking the, this position, I, I don't think that the replacement theologians realize that they are taking a position that says, I think I know what is um, the reality rather than what God has chosen to reveal and chosen to do. They're denying the sovereignty, the kingship, the authority of God himself. While often at the same time, they proclaim that there's nothing they can do to fall out of favor with God. God can change his mind with Israel, but not with them. Go figure. The enemy is really good at confusing us, but God's truth will ultimately prevail. Amen. Paul argues in this passage that there is no injustice in God's election of one over another in Romans 9 because the Lord gets to choose upon whom he will have mercy. Just like Jacob and Esau, we are all sinners who deserve death as the consequence of our sins instead of blessing. So God's choosing to bless Jacob despite his imperfections is not an injustice. Instead, it's a demonstration of his mercy where Jacob doesn't get what he deserves. And that gives hope to each one of us because we too are imperfect. We too deserve death for our sins and we too have received his mercy 
just like Jacob did. And I thank God tonight that I don't get what I deserve. How about you? We deserve death and instead he offers us eternal life. We selfishly hurt others and yet he offers his unconditional love to us. So I would encourage you tonight to just seek the Lord that you might receive from him what you do not deserve. Now, I also want to talk about the book of Judges, which we've been going through instead of the traditional Haftarah portion. Uh, last week, we ended Judges chapter 5, talking about the 40 years of rest following the defeat of Sisera under Devorah, Deborah. Uh, and then uh, in their prosperity and complacency, Judges 6 starts out telling us that once again, the Israelites did evil in the sight of the Lord. And every time we see the Israelites turning aside from God and, and going after the gods of the inhabitants of the land and, and the nations that surround them, it's just an opportunity for God to reveal in an even greater way his faithfulness, uh, his unconditional love uh, towards them. So the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Midianites and along with the Amalekites, uh, they would destroy the food that Israel grew, causing them and their animals to starve. Uh, and as a result, what do the children of Israel do? They cry out unto the Lord, just like they cried unto the Lord when they were enslaved in Egypt. Just like we cried unto the Lord when we realized that we were in bondage to sin. And what did the Lord do? He sent a deliverer. He sent Moses to deliver the Jewish people out of bondage in Egypt. He sent his son, his innocent, sinless son, to be sacrificed that we might be delivered from our bondage to sin. Here, the Lord first sends a prophet to remind the people of all that he has done for them. Now, what would we do in this situation? What do we do when our children rebel against our instructions for the umpteenth time? What do we say? Don't come crying to me. I told you not to do that. Right? Or it's only me. Um, <clears throat> and then when things do go wrong, what do we tend to say? Serves you right? I mean, that's our feeling when it happens over and over and over and they don't seem to be getting the message. But that's not how God reacts towards Israel. The Lord sends the deliverer. He sends the way of blessing, the way of restoration, the way of reconciliation. In Judges chapter 6, it is Gidon, uh, Gideon in the English. He finds him under a strong tree. Most translations say oak tree. Uh, some of them say terebinth, I think. I don't have any idea what a terebinth is. But stern, in the complete Jewish Bible that we use for the congregation, says pistachio tree. And I like that because pistachio is my favorite nut. Pistachio is my favorite ice cream, but I digress. The messenger of the Lord appears to Gidon, calling him a mighty warrior, which is not what he is at this point, but that's what his name suggests he could be. Gidon means one who fells trees, uh, who brings down trees. The messenger of the Lord tells Gidon that he will defeat the Midianites and tear down their altars. But Gidon is not so sure. He asks for a sign. The messenger tells Gideon in Judges 6 verse 20 to put a young goat and some matzah, some uh, unleavened cakes on a rock. And then he tells them to pour some broth over them. I'm sure this is picturing something uh, that we know will take place later um, with Elijah and the prophets of Baal. Maybe not. Uh, check out 1 Kings 18 and 19 if you're uh, not already picturing that. And then the messenger of the Lord touches the top of his staff to the meat in verse 21 of Judges 6. And fire shoots out from the rock and consumes the sacrifice. And in verse 35... Uh, Gideon sends messengers to the tribes of Manasseh, Asher, Zebulon, and Naphtali to gather up men for battle. But he still has his doubts. 
So in verse 37, he asked the Lord to cause his fleece to have dew on it the next morning with the ground surrounding the fleece to have no moisture at all. And what does he find the next morning? According to verse 38, he gets exactly what he asked for. But he still has doubts. Can you identify? I know I can. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I'd like to think that when I saw the fleece having exactly what I asked for and the ground around it being dry, that I would say, okay, Lord, uh, I, this is from you. But I have a feeling that I would be more like Gideon and say, you know, Lord, let's, let's try one more thing. Let's try this time having the ground be all wet and the fleece be dry. And according to verse 40, that's what happens, what Gideon finds the next day. Now we know this is from the Lord. And so we're sure that something exciting is about to happen. But the problem is that's the last verse in Judges chapter 6. So you got to come back next week to find out what exciting may happen. But right now we're going to give you an opportunity for something exciting. And that is to accept Messiah's sacrifice on your behalf. Perhaps before you came tonight, you didn't realize that God has sent his son as our deliverer. And that that is the only way we can be freed from our bondage to sin. And the good news is we can experience the unconditional love of God despite our rebellion against him, despite our sinful ways. This love was demonstrated when uh, Yeshua willingly offered up himself as the acceptable sacrifice for your sins and mine, as God allowed his execution of his sinless son to take place. You know, he could have struck down every single person that was getting ready to execute his sinless son. But instead, he allowed that to go through just so that we could be reconciled to him, just so that we could understand what his love is all about. So I'd like to ask right now with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you've never accepted Yeshua's sacrifice on your behalf, but you would like to right now, all I would ask you to do is raise your hand and you can put it right back down as a sign that, You've never done this before, but you want to make this commitment tonight. Is there anyone? We also have this on, on video, and there may be somebody watching on video. And I would just encourage you, if, if you feel the leading um, to receive Yeshua as your Messiah, uh, that you would tell somebody about it and that you would walk in the blessing of the Lord from this day forward. And that as you read the scriptures, you would come to an even greater understanding uh, of what uh, is ahead for you in your life once you have uh, submitted to um, God's plan and the, included in that plan is the way of restoration and reconciliation through the sacrifice of his son. Now I want to address those who um, have already uh, accepted Yeshua's sacrifice, but uh, Maybe you haven't been accepting of the way that the Lord has made you. Uh, maybe when I talked about reminding him of his mistakes, you realized that uh, you felt like God wasn't yet able to use you. But now you realize uh, that you can accept his sovereignty, that he has made you just the way he needs you to be, to be a blessing to this world, to minister uh, to those that he would bring across your path. Will, look, will you allow him to use you just as you are from this day forward? Will you trust in him with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding more each day from this day forward to accept his sovereignty by saying, Lord, not my will, but your will be done in my life. Or maybe you thought that as believers, we could live any way we wanted, but you now realize that the Torah hasn't been done away with that God's instructions to his people have been given for their blessing and they are eternal. The grass will wither, the, um, uh, the, flower, uh, the flower will die, the, grass will, the flower will wither, the grass will die, but the word of the Lord will stand forever or something like that. Um, <clears throat> the point is that God's word is eternal, that, that the living word can breathe uh, life uh, into your life. 
You see what it says in John chapter 14, verse 15. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. So just as Abraham was obedient to the Lord's instructions, we are called to be obedient to those instructions as well, to understand the truths that God would reveal through them. So if you feel God's spirit working in one of these areas uh, revealed to you tonight, if you feel um, God just speaking to your heart about a change that he would have you to make, I would just ask you to raise your hand as an acknowledgement of your commitment so that you will realize that you are making this commitment uh, and, and that um, when the enemy comes along and says, you know, you didn't really make that commitment, you'll say, oh, yeah, I did. I put my hand up uh, just to be a servant of God, to serve him in a greater way uh, for his purposes and for his glory. As Lord, we thank you for your mercy. We thank you that we don't get what we deserve. We thank you for sending your son so that we might have forgiveness for our sins, that by his sacrifice, we are able to be uh, reconciled with the creator of the universe. We thank you for sending the Ruach, the spirit to help us to better understand your ways, which are higher than our ways. And we acknowledge your sovereignty and thank you that you made us just the way we are for your purposes. And Lord, that you can use us from this day forward in ways that we can't even imagine.